Hey everyone, my name is Scott Nance and welcome to today's SAG After Foundation Career Conversation. Before we get started, I just wanted to alert all of you to the SAG After Foundation COVID-19 Fund. Uh, for those of you who are still struggling with this uh, ever going pandemic, check out the comments section below to see how you can apply for COVID-19 relief from the foundation. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure and joy, and I'm so excited to moderate today's conversation, our career conversation with an actor who has been nominated and has won so many awards over the many years. He is a SAG Award nominee, along with the cast of 2014's The Imitation Game, and he is the winner of the Olivier Award for Best Actor in a Play for A View from the Bridge. Hello, Mark Strong. <laughs> hello, hello. Thank you for having me. It's really lovely to be here. Well, I got to just start, you know, you're, you have been working nonstop, it feels like to me anyway, for almost 30 years now uh, mm. on stage, on TV, on the big screen. And with such a, a, a vibrant career, I got to ask, was, was acting always part of the plan? Was that something you always wanted to do from the very beginning? Uh, I, you know, I was never a kind of twinkle toes, you know, one of those kids where people said, you know, you should be on the stage. Huh. Um, at school, I never really got involved with plays. I, I wish in retrospect now that I had. Uh, I didn't really know anything about the theatre. I thought people in films lived in another world. I didn't have any family that were kind of involved in the business. So to me, it wasn't ever something that was going to be accessible. Um, but I was fascinated every time my mother took me to the theatre. I loved movies, uh, and the time came once I made an initial choice to study law, <laughs> which I realized wasn't for me. I had a kind of epiphany and, and just made the decision that I would, I would follow my heart and uh, try and become an actor. So when you made that choice, like what were some of the films or shows or stage plays that, that just inspired you, you know, things that you, you just loved, and this is before you even made the switch? Yeah, well, I remember, I remember my mum taking me to the cinema to see Diamonds Are Forever, the Bond movie in the cinema, and I was just a little kid, and I, I was transfixed by it. I just thought it was the most exciting, amazing thing. Uh, when I was a little older, they took me to see Jaws, would you believe, and uh, terrified the life out of me, but, um, you know, just made me understand how you can transport somebody's imagination with a movie. Um, and then sometimes we would go to the theatre. We went to see musicals generally. We went to see, a, a, you know, musicals we probably never heard of. A, a chap called Tommy Steele, who was a, a singer, did a thing called Half a Sixpence, which was about a photographer. There was a, a thing that Edward Woodward did called Babes in the Wood. These were my mother's choices, but I was nevertheless completely transfixed by them when she took me to, to, to see them. By the way, you're not alone with uh, being uh, terrorized by Jaws at a very young age. My folks were six, I was six years old when my parents took me to see Jaws. I mean, what, what were they thinking? But You're, you're kidding. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's yeah. pretty hardcore. Hardcore. But you know what? Listen, that started my love of film and my love for the craft. And uh, you said you had an epiphany. Do you remember when that was or what, what stirred that? I think it was as I used to go to and fro uh, towards the kind of the, uh, the, the law faculty with my heavy books under my arm. And I remember looking through the windows of the drama faculty and they were all playing trust games and they were all sitting around in a circle and they were all kind of had books in their hands and were laughing and they just seemed to be having a way better time <laughs> than I was. And I just realized, I think the epiphany was that if you're going to do something with your life, you better make sure if you can, you've got to do something you enjoy because it'll make that journey so much easier. And I went in there and I asked those guys, you know, what was going on? And, uh, you know, that's how I kind of started. I just thought, I think I'd much rather be in this room than that room. And I, I made the crazy choice, of course. It was total naivety. And uh, everybody at the time advised me not to do it. They said I was crazy. But I just caught the bug and thought, yeah, you know, that's, I really want to have a go at that. And that's how it started. You know, uh, life, felt, life really comes down to a few moments. And for you, you know, that was one of them and you obviously made the right choice. So like when it came to your first acting gig ever, what was it? 
I think they did a play, uh, the Dream Play by Strindberg, which was done as a promenade. I never understood the play. I played the officer. I ran around with a bunch of flowers. Uh, I, I still don't really understand that play. But the combination of things that I was having a go at, I think it just by osmosis, I, I grew in confidence. I grew in understanding my strengths, the kind of parts that I probably should be playing and the kind of parts that perhaps somebody else should be playing. And it was just a slow process of, of elimination, really, and, and learning and uh, an appetite to give everything a chance. When you were going through that phase where you suddenly had to start doing uh, a process that actors loathe, which is the audition process, yeah. So how did you manage your nerves, your uh, uh, expectations maybe? Just how did you manage yourself during that process, which is like probably the hardest thing for an actor to do is an audition. Uh, how did you navigate your way through that and get good at it? Well, uh, after university doing drama and English, I went to the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. And there we used to have to bring audition pieces every week. So you had to have two speeches and a song. And every week, come the end of the week, you had to get in there and it had to be different from anything that you'd done before. Uh, so that was an incredible learning process. But there were other tiny features that you were taught, like when you entered the room, you had to have your head held high. When you closed the door, you didn't turn your back on the people that were interviewing you. So there was a real, it was almost like a business meeting. You know, you were kind of made to understand that there was a technique to the process of auditioning. Uh, and... Um, uh, again, just practice got me there and I learned what speeches were most successful and I, I stuck with those. Um, yeah. Well, around, I guess, 93 or 94, you had your first credit, your first official credit on the small screen. And that was for EastEnders, the very, very popular, long running uh, British series. And your credit is telephone engineer. All right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, yeah was, what was that uh, like? I mean, really to be part of a, what was then like really a big production? Well, I'd been on the stage. I'd, I'd trained for the stage, uh, both university and drama school. And I'd been doing plays. My first um, season was at a place called the Worcester Swan, where I did nine plays in nine months. It was monthly rep, where you were learning during the day. And in the evening, you were performing the play from the month before. Uh, and I then went to the Manchester Contact Theatre and uh, performed two or three plays there. And I couldn't get a look into television because in those days you came out trained for the theater and television was quite an exotic thing to get involved with. And a lot of us British actors cut our teeth on, on those shows like EastEnders, The Bill, Casualty, you know, it was about medical shows, police shows. Uh, who knew EastEnders would run for as long as it did? But it was just a way of getting in front of the camera and, uh, and having a go. I mean, I had no idea where the camera was. I didn't realize how you act for the camera. I just got on there, said my lines like I was in a play. And uh, yeah, that, that got me up and running. Uh, but at that time also, soon after, you were kind of on a roll with British television, with, with roles in Our Friends in the North, Birth, Marriages and Death, uh, The Jury, uh, of course, uh, Prime Suspect, which you reprised a role many years later. Um, you know, what was that? Uh, you know, you were, you were an actor on the rise. You were doing more and more work, having bigger and bigger roles. Uh, what were the lessons as an actor that you were picking up then that carried you through and helped you continue to grow? Like what were some of the tricks of the trade that you learned from all that work doing British TV and stage? What I did a lot was watch other actors. So uh, in TV, I kind of, uh, and in front of a camera, I watched the size of performances. I watched what people were doing with different lenses, with different uh, distances from the lens. Mm. I understood how you use the camera, how you had to have a kind of technique. It isn't just a free for all. There is, there is a way to learn how to act with the camera and with a microphone that's very close to you. Uh, on stage, I used to stand in the wings and watch like Ian McKellen and Brian Cox when I did Richard III and King Lear with them. And you would learn not only how they were on stage, but how they were off stage, how they behaved off stage, what, what effort they put into the parts they were playing, the thought that they put into the characters that they were building, the way they treated the other members of the cast. Stuff like that was a kind of a whole, it was a whole way of understanding how our business worked. And, um, and all of it was, was valuable. And I think it was just really watching and learning.
is the best way I can describe it. And then practicing. And the trouble with our industry is it's, you know, you don't get many opportunities to fail. You know, you need to try and get it right because if you get it wrong too many times, you don't get another shot. Right. So it's an, it's a fine knife edge of, of, uh, learning and putting into practice things that you're, you think might work without knowing whether or not they will. And then you obviously, as everybody always says, you need an enormous amount of luck. And, um, and that seemed to come my way. Yeah, you mentioned some actors like Ian McKellen, but what about some of the directors that you worked with, uh, whether it's stage or TV? Well, uh, who comes to mind? Richard Eyre was running the National Theatre, and I did. I was there for about five years, and he really gave me my break there. I was in a. I played playing a small part in Richard III. He gave me the the lead part in a in an Eduardo de Filippo play with with Ian McKellen, and uh, that kind of got me going on on stage. Danny Boyle, I've worked with on stage and on TV and on film. Um, oh, yeah. I suppose, yeah, over here you can you can do that. Roger Michelle, I worked with in the theatre before he went on to make movies. Um, uh, yeah, there were lots of kind of cross fertilization of, of theater, TV and film in the UK. I think in the US it was probably more delineated. It was uh, once you were either a theater actor or a film actor or a TV actor, you stayed pretty much, I imagine, within, your, within that group. Sure. Whereas, sure. yeah, we had the kind of opportunity to, to move between the three. And in fact, my career sort of roughly worked out as the first part was staged, then there was a lot of television, and then it, it kind of moved into movies. You know, it's interesting to point that out, uh, the differences between the United States and, and the UK with that, because you know, for a long time, TV actors were TV actors, movie actors were movie actors. You know, you had a rare, rare situation where you had a TV actor crossover to film. But yeah. You know, because of streaming, and because there's so much choice stuff on, on the streaming services, you have a lot of film actors doing a lot of, you know, quote unquote, TV work. Uh, sure. Nicole Kidman, uh, Reese Witherspoon, among many. But when it came to your, you know, what you love to do, when it came to what you felt like you were learning the most from, did you feel like you had a preference for stage, for TV, or for film? Or did it just, they all have their different merits? They do all have their different merits. And the truth is that once you've done a lot of stage work for a long period of time, I was really itching to get in front of a camera. Partly because often you'd, you'd work really hard on a play. You know, you'd spend weeks rehearsing, you know, the tension levels and the, the kind of effort required to get something up and running on a stage. And then you'd get some perhaps, I don't know, mediocre three, three out of five star review after all that hard work, which is fine at first. And then if it happens again, then you kind of take that. But if you suddenly, I felt like I was doing a lot of theater and I was putting a lot of energy out there, but I thought there was, there was more to be had. So I got in front of a camera. In fact, I remember auditioning for somebody who, um, the question was always when you went in there, they went, and what, what, uh, what film have you done before? And I'd have to say, I haven't done any film before, but I've mainly been working in the theater and they go, okay, thanks very much. <laughs> and then uh, you'd leave knowing you hadn't got the job. And I finally cracked when, when one guy said to me, what, what film have you done before? I went, look, I haven't done any film before. I really, I've just done theatre, but I, I don't understand how, in this industry how you get into making movies unless somebody gets you started. When, he, uh, uh, when I asked him in retrospect why he gave me the job, he said, well, you seemed so unhappy that you weren't being able to get started. So I thought I'd help out. You know, back in 97, you, you, there, were, there were a few actors and directors that you wound up working with many times over the years. One of them who you worked with, I'd say five times in front of the camera over the last 20 years or over a 20 year period is Colin Firth, who you worked yeah. with for the first time on the, uh, the British version of Fever Pitch. Yeah. So when you're working with someone like Colin Firth, like what was it like the first time you did work with him and how did your, your relationship in front of the camera evolve over those 20 years, over the five films uh, over that time? Well, that's an interesting question because the industry here is, is obviously much smaller than it is in the States. So you come across the same people, but to have worked with somebody that many times, it isn't that usual. I do remember being very competitive with him the first time we did Fever Pitch because I was an Arsenal supporter and I wanted to play his part, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> and they gave me the other part. And I wanted to be in the movie because that was my team. So I did it. Um, but we got on like a house on fire. We went to the football together. We watched it together and we, we became friends. And I suppose over the years I've watched his career and I suppose he's watched mine and 
we have our own uh, merits, the things that we do that we're best at. And I always marvel at him and his, his ease on screen and, um, you know, the choices that he makes. And so whenever I got together with him again on, on the various films that we made, uh, we just catch up. It's like, you know, that's the wonderful thing about this industry is once yeah. you've worked with somebody, your family, you know, you don't see, you work with somebody, you don't see them for 20 years. And when you see them again, it's like not a day's gone by. Well, I feel like in the years, in the recent years that followed it, you know, my first, first time I saw you on the big screen was in a, an overlooked 1999 film called Sunshine, which was the first of two movies that you made uh, with that title. But it was Istvan Sabo, I believe, is the director's yeah, name. Yeah. Uh, Ray Fiennes, and it was a an epic film about identity uh, set against, you know, with the, this uh, this Jewish family. And uh, it was a wonderful, wonderful film. And I it was my first introduction to you on the big screen. But it's also around that time that you started to, I would say, cross over to American audiences uh, with by working with a director like Guy Ritchie, who you worked yeah. with, I think, three times. First time yeah. was Revolver in 2005. So, so around, what was it like for you around that time? Like, how did you feel like the roles you were getting were starting to be different? How did you feel like you were evolving as an actor, especially with a stylized director like Guy Ritchie? I felt I was fighting very hard to try and get into the movie business. Um, having done stage, that seemed to segue into kind of little television roles that got me kind of knowing what I was doing in front of a camera. Uh, but the movies were something it was very difficult to get into in the UK. We didn't make that many here. Uh, all the best ones were being made over in the US, <laughs> but getting over there was a big step to make. Um, I did a TV uh, show about a gangster, a 1960s gangster called Harry Starks. The show was called The Long Firm. And I think Guy saw it and he wanted me in his movie because his forte at the time were making these kind of gangster movies. So I think he wanted to check me out. We got on really well. He put me in, uh, in Revolver and then, yeah, we worked together three times. So I felt that was a really fortuitous kind of meeting. And I liked his energy and I liked uh, the way he worked and we were friends. So it was a very easy choice to make uh, to be in his movies. But the interesting thing was um, there was a time when I, I made, I did two very small parts kind of together. One was in Polanski's Oliver Twist. I played a character called uh, Toby Crackett, who uh, is normally written out of the films because uh, he's Bill Sykes' henchman. And it's much more interesting having Bill Sykes and Oliver without Toby. But Toby's a fantastic character. And I got cast by Polanski. And uh, for some reason, when I turned up, they put me in a massive orange wig and huge buck teeth with a big top hat. And I was like, wow, how did he see that guy in me when he met me? But I did it and I had fun with it. And it was a very kind of classic Dickensian fun part to play. But at the same time, uh, Stephen Gagan had cast me in Syriana to play a very heavy duty kind of um, embryo terrorist, if you like. He was a third generation Lebanese Muslim uh, who had been an ally and was now crossing away from the US because he was feeling hard done by and it was a pretty hardcore guy to play mm. and funnily enough those two films came out very close together and I got a call from the Cohen brothers to go and meet them and the reason was they'd seen these two films and they couldn't believe that that was the same actor so that was kind of how I got into movies um, so on the one hand I was I was doing stuff with Guy in the UK and on the other I think the US was just starting to take notice so it was just a happy accident of two very different parts happening at the same time. What was the outcome of those initial meetings that you had with the Cohen brothers? Well, they, they, um, Ellen Chenoweth, who put me together with them, said um, they probably won't say much. She said, be ready. Because obviously it was a massive journey to go over. In fact, I was in LA and I was going back to the UK, but I, I broke my flight to go to New York. Now, you know, the UK is a small place. It doesn't take long to get anywhere. But, you know, I felt like I'd made a big journey to come from LA to New York. And, you know, I walked into the room that they were in and they were like, hi, how are you? They were very kind of friendly, but they didn't, they didn't say much. And they went, okay, let's, uh, let's do the scene. And I'd learned the scene in the garage. Uh, there's a scene in the garage uh, I think there's a coin involved 
and I'd, I'd learned it and I, pl- I did it and they went, great. Yeah, try, try it again. And then I did it again and they went, okay, great. Thanks very much. And I was like in and out in half an hour. And so I was back on the streets of New York thinking, God, I've come all this way for that. And anyway, it turned out that they were, um, you know, I, I, it was, the part was between Javier Bardem and myself. It was for no country for old men. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And, um, and there was a time when they said they thought Javier's dates weren't going to work. So I should, be ready you know and I was very excited turns out Javier's dates did work he went on to win the Oscar <laughs> and uh, quite rightly too and I, and I understand that casting as well because they were looking for a character that was kind of other is the best way to describe him and I think he just fitted it perfectly and um, but it was a great brush with them and I've met them a few times since and uh, I think they're great guys and I'm, I'm a huge fan of theirs so to get into the room with them was at that time you know massive you know, Mark, the, the, you're talking about a, a situation that has happened to many actors where they're this close, it's up between them and one other person for whatever reason, and it goes to the other person for whatever reason. So how, how do you process that? How do you, how does, how do you move on from that? Like, how do you so sort of roll with the punches when something like that happens? You learn to move on. I mean, I'm beginning to realize that the answer to a lot of your questions is you just have to learn, you know, you, you learn how to move and breathe and hit the back wall of an auditorium on stage. You learn the technique on camera. It's just a process. If you're lucky enough to have a, a long career, it's, uh, it's a process. And part of that learning is also how to deal with not getting the parts that you might want. You know, it's not a meritocracy, our business. You know, the best actors aren't working. There's a lot of terrific actors who aren't. And there's a lot of not so terrific ones who are. You know, it's just, there are other factors at play in our industry. Um, And you just have to kind of, you have to live with that. And I, I, you know, I was, I was sad that the part had passed me by, but I'm, I'm a kind of, you know, I'm a, Uh, I just believe that things are right when they're right. And if something isn't yours in the moment, there's a reason for it. And in that particular instance, I think Javier was better casting. So it never ate me up. And other parts that I haven't got, um, I've never really, I've never really followed up to see who got those parts, particularly, you know, you, you, you just learn a way of kind of going, okay, that's that one move on. You've got to keep moving forwards all the time. Um, yeah, and I think I've, ju- I've just learned to kind of not get too engaged when you're told you're going to meet someone or when you're asked to read a particular script or part that you're really into. You just, you just wait, see how it goes down. If you get the part, then it's great. And if it doesn't, that's fine too. You move on to the next one. You know, around 2007, you, know, to, you talk about Syriana in 2005. Like, this was like the beginning of like the real crossover to mainstream audiences. Uh, you know, another... Big film around that time, that 2007 was Stardust and uh, the other movie, Sunshine. And, uh, and then actually Stardust began a, a really uh, prosperous relationship with director Matthew Vaughn. Yeah. So how did that uh, relationship, because you made a bunch of movies with Matthew Four, I think, and then compare to working with Guy Ritchie, who you made three movies with, how do those relationships differ? Well, they were very close, Matthew and Guy, because when they started out in the industry together, Guy was the director, Matthew was the producer. They made Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, then they made Snatch. And the famous thing is that they did it themselves. I think they were looking to the industry to help them out when they were starting out. Nobody was interested in giving them a leg up. So they kind of circumvented the industry and, and did it for themselves. And they, they were very successful at doing that. And I think that taught them that you, you rely on yourself. Um, there was a time then when they parted ways because I think Matthew wanted to direct as well. Uh, and I think his first film was Layer Cake. And what I quickly realized is that both of those guys, they're, they're, they're quite honorable. You know, they, they stick with their people. So if you work with them and you get on with them, the chances are they will bring you back. And they had a kind of cast of people that they always tried to get together if they could. So it was no accident I ended up doing three films with Guy. Guy's, Guy's sets are, are very relaxed. Uh, he kind of, he came through music videos. So a lot of his talent, I think, is in the edit. I think he takes the raw material and then the real magic for him happens in the edit when he puts it together. 
Matthew uh, is slightly different in that he is very, he's much more meticulous. I think before the thing even happens, there's a lot of planning has gone in. It doesn't happen on the day. There's a lot of thought has already gone into everything. And yeah, Stardust was a fantastic, I think a vastly underrated movie. It didn't get a huge release for some reason, but it's a brilliant film. Um, yep, I love it. Yeah, yeah. Had, uh, it was uh, uh, Michelle Pfeiffer and uh, De Niro. I mean, it's a wonderful, wonderful movie. So, so Mark, like around, I mean, working with Matthew Vaughn, you know, 2010, he directed a film that really kicked the door open for the superhero movie genre that was, uh, had really been going pretty strong at that time, uh, consistently for about 10 years, starting with the first X-Men movie. But the movie I'm referring to is Kick-Ass. And that movie was awesome. R-rated, you know, balls to the wall kind of an action movie. Uh, you know, foul mouth, uh, you, know, uh, you know, young girl, Chloe Grace Moritz. It's such a fun, fun movie, but you really crushed it as the bad guy. And uh, I, like, what, is, what makes playing the bad guy so much fun? Well, a guy like Frank D'Amico is, is yeah. you know, when I started out as an actor, I wanted to play characters and uh, I wanted to play parts that were as far from me as possible and parts that were fun, you know, and uh, getting to be a, a New York kind of mafia boss was the stuff of boyhood dreams. Uh, the fact that it came in that particular film after Stardust was was quite crazy. I remember Matthew, actually, we were around at someone's house, Dexter Fletcher's house, I think, playing poker. And Matthew turned up with the opening sequence of Kick-Ass on his phone or on his computer. He wanted to show it to us. And having just done Stardust with him, a very different movie, I remember thinking, what the hell is this? You know, what? what, is, what? I'd never seen anything like it before. I thought he'd lost his mind. But it did make me laugh, and I thought it was a brilliant opening sequence. Anyway, transpires that it was, uh, it's the kind of film you want to make that you know, just know is great fun. You can have great fun with it. And uh, that was, um, you know, I was very lucky to be involved with that and to, and to get to play a character like Frank D'Amico. But just the following year, the following couple of years, you made, in terms of production value, probably the two of the biggest uh, movies you had done to, to that date in terms of budget, in terms of scope, in terms of visual effects uh, and all that, uh, you know, uh, Green Lantern and uh, John Carter. Yeah. So when you get to that point where you're part of a, like a machine, like those kinds of movies, how, how uh, does that challenge you as an actor like never before? What's intoxicating is the scope of them, the size of them, you know, and I suppose once you've done a couple or a few of those kinds of movies, you know, you hanker to get back to the smaller movies. Maybe you hanker to, hanker to get back to the stage. The, 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 the reason that I moved from stage to TV to film was because you're always looking for something that's different from the thing that you've done before. Well, those huge movies were very different to anything that I've been involved with. And, um, of course you don't turn something like that down. They were, they were great parts in both. I mean, Sinestro, for example, you know, I was a fan of the comics and I just thought if you can really recreate that guy on screen, that would be a real challenge. I mean, having done eight hours in the makeup chair for Danny Boyle's Sunshine playing Pinbacker, I, I was kind of up for a challenge of, of transformation. That's, that's for me was always, that was what was interesting about acting was the potential for transformation and being something that you weren't. And Sinestro was a huge leap from me to this big red guy with the pencil moustache and the widow's peak hair. And, um, and the same sort of John Carter of Mars, you know, was just a world that was just extraordinary. And Andrew Stanton had such a great vision for it. It's such a shame to me that both those films, first of all, didn't have sequels, but also didn't kind of do the business and, um, and uh, uh, engage the audience that they should have done. Because they're still, I think both of them are still really good films. I completely agree with that. Yep. Yeah, That's sometimes I, films come out and people just aren't, they, then it's not the right time for them, you know? And I got to tell you, uh, you know, being a big comic book guy, I, you know, I grew up reading comics of all sorts, Marvel and DC especially. Green Lantern was one of them. I know, I know Sinestro real well. And uh, I was more excited to see the character of Sinestro than actually Hal Jordan Green Lantern. And I thought you crushed it. I thought, like, that is how you play Sinestro on the big screen. <laughs> um, but when you 
made these bigger films. You know, you talked about going from big and kind of scaling back and getting to, to the root of an actor again, which you did around that time with Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy, which was nominated for three Academy Awards, including Best Picture. So what is it like to go from something so big like John Carter or Green Lantern back to something that is uh, far more restrained like Tinker, Taylor, Soldier, Spy? You feel much more engaged, yeah. I think. Because on those big movies, you're a very, very small part in a very, very big machine. Part of your talent on those things is to be patient. You know, if you need to wait for eight hours in your trailer until they've set up this incredibly complicated shot, so be it. You know, what you're giving is your patience almost. And then when it's your time, you do your piece of the machine. When you go back to a smaller kind of amazing ensemble cast like Tinker Taylor and that a story like that with a director like that, you suddenly are much more involved. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a joy going to work every day. You knew that every day would yield something that you would be proud of. There was no waiting around. There was no, you know, huge trailer nonsense. Everybody was like, it was like a theater company, that company. Yeah. Um, and it, and it just feeds another part of your soul. But that's not to say that then going back and doing another big movie is out of the question. I think the whole thing is variety. If you have the opportunity to have a variety of characters play a variety of those parts and, and, and a different variety of sizes of, of film and, and whether then you go back to the stage and do TV, I think that's what it's all about. You know, one of the other films around that time, or actually it's probably a little more recent, I think it was 2016, a film that, that actually rocked my world when I saw it. And, but again, it was one of those films that just didn't find enough of an audience. But everyone watching right now, I encourage you to watch the movie Miss Sloan uh, yeah. with Jessica Chastain. That movie was fantastic. And yeah. Jessica Chastain is an amazing actor. Like what... You've worked with her a couple times too. Yeah. She's, she is incredibly professional. That was what I was impressed with, with Jessica. She kind of stayed on track the whole time because that character needed to be on track and she was always ready, knew exactly what she wanted to do. Um, very, very professional. That's what I remember about Jessica and very kind of uh, very driven to get the character right. And Miss Sloan was an incredible piece of writing. It was a first-time writer, Jonathan Pereira. He'd never written a, a movie script before. Um, and John, John Madden directed it, who is an incredibly safe pair of hands, a really wonderful director who's come through the theatre. And uh, uh, it was, it was um, a really classy project, I thought. And, uh, yeah, happy to be involved. Also, Zero Dark Thirty was the first movie that Catherine Bigelow directed since she, still to this day, became the only woman to get uh, an Oscar for directing. So what, just generally, working with a director like Catherine Bigelow, who's just one of the greats? You know, what's really strange is the realization that that was probably the first time I'd ever worked with a female director. Mm -hmm. Having been in the business for years, first time with a female director, which is just crazy, yeah. uh, but very exciting because obviously I was a big fan of The Hurt Locker and uh, Mark Bowles, was a terrific writer. Uh, the experience was kind of crazy because I, I went over to LA to meet them. And when I got there to this incredible house up in the hills, I was sort of jet lagged and blown away by the experience, first of all. And then I was given a scene to have a look at with a view to doing it there and then that evening. I didn't know what was going to be asked of me. I didn't know if we were just going to have a chat or, but like, here's the scene. We're going to nip out for 10 minutes and we'll see you and come back in 10 minutes and we'll just, we'll go through it. And it's the scene in the film in which I kind of berate everybody uh, in the, in the room. And uh, I remember walking out onto the kind of terrace of this beautiful apartment, looking out over Hollywood and it was sort of sunset. It was quite magical and just realizing okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really give them both barrels. And I learned the thing there and then in 10 minutes. I'm not a great line learner, but I just, I for some reason, had the focus to be able to learn that scene. I went back in. I kind of did it for them. It's an incredibly kind of powerful, aggressive speech. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, um, Catherine just went, uh, wow. I, I don't think they quite knew what to say. I'm not sure they were expecting that kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 
forced to come at them. Um, but she gave, she offered me the job there and then, on the, and I thought, well, that's that's great. And I, and I didn't do it as an exercise. I did it because I really admired her. I thought the script was terrific, and I wanted to be involved. Another script that I think is terrific. Another story that I think is terrific because it's just so still uh, so little known. The Imitation Game, uh, in which the whole cast was nominated for SAG uh, Awards for Best Acting Ensemble. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, that movie was magnificent. Another film that I think was a little overlooked, but uh, a top-notch cast, top-notch script, direction, all of it. Uh, generally, like what made working the the imitation game so unique to you? When you've got a good script, you know you know you're in a good place. Uh, you know you can go to work every day, and you're not working out how you're going to make a scene work and what adjustments need to be made to make a scene work. You know that it's there on the page, and your job is to just inhabit that. Um, the period nature of a film like that, as well, does all the work for you because obviously you're wearing the clothes, you're on the set. That you know, it just it just feels like you're there. So I loved doing that film, and I played a very kind of sardonic, very laid back. Uh, the head of MI6, which is a, a wonderfully kind of very British part to play. I hadn't done many of those. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And I knew Benedict and Kira really well and, and Charles Dance really well. And, and being on set with people you admire, but also get on with makes, you know, makes the whole thing just, just really easy. Yeah. Well, I gotta, I'm, I'm going to just assume that this next movie you made, which came out less than a year ago, although lately it feels like it came out 50 years ago, uh, is 1917, uh, yeah. directed by Sam Mendes. And of course, this movie, Oscar nominated Best Picture and Best Director, and shot in one complete take, uh, or, you know, at least it, you know, certainly feels yeah. like it was. And yeah. how was making that movie a unique challenge, not just to you, but to everyone on that cast? It was um, a phenomenal experience because it's so completely different to any other kind of film experience I've ever had. I mean, I've worked with Sam in the theatre. I did his last two plays when he was uh, artistic director of the Donmar Warehouse in Covent Garden. We did um, Uncle Vanya and Twelfth Night together. In fact, we took them over to BAM, played them in... Uh, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. So I knew him very well and we'd been on tour together and we kind of kept in touch as friends, but I hadn't worked with him. And he just rang me up and said, look, I've got this part in this film. It's not a big part, but uh, the guy is probably the only guy that's nice to these two boys who are the main protagonists of the movie. And he said, I just thought of you. So uh, it's up to you whether you want to come and do it. It's just, a, it's a couple of days. And, uh, and I didn't even really, have to process anything other than, you know, I read the script and it's him. And I said, yeah, I'm in. I then found out that the process was going to be this extraordinary uh, series of, of, of scenes that were then going to be blended together in one take. And so I did, I have a couple of scenes in the movie and I literally only did a couple of days work because you turn up the night before the following morning, you're in uh, costume and makeup. You go out into the field you know, or next to the bridge, wherever our, my two scenes were. You rehearse the scene a number of times, and then basically you shoot it. And when it's done, that's it. You all go home. There's no lens changing. There's no camera position changing. There's no cut-ins, two shots, one shots, nothing. It was just the one sequence. So in a way, it was like doing little pieces of theatre, just little five-minute segments of theatre, which, you know, it's not that unusual. But in a movie... It's not, movies just aren't made like that. No, they're really not. Uh, uh, that was definitely uh, an extraordinary movie to experience in a theater, let alone, I'm, I'm guessing, to make. But what, all the actors that you've worked with and uh, all the directors that you've worked with, like, is there one or a few maybe that you sort of really look at as uh, defining moments of your career because of everything that you learned everything that you uh, uh, just maybe just enjoyed working with them? Well, again, like, like the answer to a lot of, of other points that you've brought up, it's uh, they, it, you learn from all of them. There's, you learn something different from every one of them. I mean, Sam, for example, creates a set which is ego-free and 
very rarely tense. He's very calm, makes it very easy for you. Danny Boyle, a lot of energy, you know, loves the energetic kind of thing, you know, fires you up. Guy, you have a great laugh with. Matthew, very, very particular. Ridley Scott, you know, I did uh, Robin Hood with him. He had 15 cameras at one point filming a battle sequence and he's in a horse box editing as he goes along from these 15 screens. You can see him pointing at the screen and he's thinking, I'm going to use that, I'm going to use that and that. So that was another experience, you know, doing something with, with a director like Ridley. And then Ishvan Zaba, like you said, that film Sunshine, that, that European director, they all, you know, they all have, it's, it, they all have something that you, you can, if you keep your eyes open and you keep your ears to the ground, there is something to be learned from every director and every experience mm-hmm. and every movie and play that you do. They're, they're all obviously very different and they might be different things that you learn in each one. Some might work, some might not work but you can even learn from the ones that don't work, you know? And often I think you can learn more from those kind of films than the ones that do. So with all of those directors, I feel like it's the mix, it's the mix of, of, the, of, of all of them, Catherine included, you know, that, that just helps you move forward and helps you understand what it is that you want to do and how you want to do it and the best way to work. And if you have that opportunity to work with the best people, especially in film, you know, director is everything. Leonardo DiCaprio, I remember when we did Body of Lies together, said to me, his choices were always made on the basis of the directors, because obviously they're the people that take the film and make the film. So you got to have faith that they're going to do it properly. But it's, it's the mix that's intoxicating. So when it comes to directors, uh, which I mean, the uh, uh, list you just gave is uh, impressive by any measure. Is there anyone who you haven't had yet a chance to work with that you would, you know, just love to put it out there and be like, oh, this is one director or a couple of directors that, that I definitely have in my uh, movie bucket list. The Coen brothers. Mm. <laughs> for <Yeah>. me. <laughs> Joel, I met Joel recently for a project that he was thinking of doing and I couldn't do it. And I think COVID has overtaken us, but um, one day I'm going to work with Joel and Ethan because I, I just love their movies. Um, off the top of my head, it's hard to say. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of directors I've never even heard of, you know, younger directors who are just up and coming now who have got something that they can teach me. You know, I think I know everything, but I'm sure that there's a kind of energy and a, and a kind of something that they can bring that I would be really eager to learn as well. Um, but like I say, the variety and also the variety of, of, of parts and films. I think the last few movies I've done, if I think of them are, I did a film called Stockholm with Robert Boudreau directing it with Ethan Hawke that we shot in um, Toronto about a couple of bank robbers in, in Sweden based on a true story. A uh, little indie movie, very kind of dog day afternoon, that kind of vibe shot on the hoof, didn't have too much money, but great fun. And then 1917, a very complicated, a very considered, you know, beautiful piece of work. And then Shazam, you know, a big, funny superhero movie. I mean, those three movies right there, to do those in a row is a real privilege because three completely different types of film, three completely different sizes of film, three completely different characters. And that, that for me ultimately is... is um, is the best bit. Like I, like I say, it's the variety. So I've learned a little bit from all of the directors I've worked with, and I'm really looking forward to finding some new people to learn new stuff from. Well, you, you brought up COVID. You brought up, uh, you know, I, I started the conversation about our COVID-19 fund because there are so many members of the foundation who are really having a hard time. But uh, in terms of inspiration, in terms of advice, like, what was the best advice that you ever got and who gave it to you? And how is that something that you could pass on to viewers and foundation members who are not just struggling with their careers, but also just in general because of these challenging times? The first piece of advice that I was ever given in all seriousness that was to do with being a professional actor was given to me by a chap called Chris Dennis, who was the principal of the Bristol Old Vic Theatre School. (laughs) And the first day, the first morning that we started, we all gathered in a room and the first thing he said to us was, if there's anything else in this world that you think you might want to do more than this, you should leave now because this is going to take up all of your time and you're going to have to be completely dedicated. 
And if there is something else that you're thinking might be worth your time, go and do that. I'm telling you, go and do that now because you may be forever unhappy. Um, and it scared the living daylights out of us because it made us realize, you know, it's a tough old journey kind of uh, getting into acting. But advice has come in many forms, I think, over the years. And I've probably just taken a lot of it in by osmosis. I can't think particularly of anybody other than that first piece of advice that I was given that would be useful. But if I had something to pass on, it would just be, you know, don't, don't let it control you. you know it's like i said it's not a meritocracy this business so it's very easy to become frustrated that things aren't working out the way that you want them to work out it it can become really soul destroying that you're just not getting the work that you know you're capable of doing if only somebody would use their subjective choice and choose you rather than the next guy but the fact is all you can do is be ready all you can do is mix with other actors Try and work whenever you can work. You know, don't be too choosy. Uh, just be involved. Go and go to the theatre if you can. Obviously, it's difficult in these times, but watch movies, watch performances, see what you like, what you learn from, and try and mix all of those things together. And just, you know, just wait for your moment because if you're going to have your moment, it's going to come, you know, and you do need a bit of luck. That's a fact. And, uh, a lot of the friends that I started out with who wanted to be in this business as much as I did, they've kind of over the years, they've decided to go and do something else. They're not unhappy. You know, uh, I think the unhappy ones are the ones that stay chained to the idea that it's got to happen um, rather than wait, wait for the possibility that it might, if you know what I mean. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one, one more question before we uh, wrap this uh, amazing conversation up. Your new show on spectrum is temple. And uh, yeah. tell us about it. <laughs> well, Temple was the first opportunity I got to be an executive producer on something. Um, my wife, Liza Marshall, is a very successful producer in her own right. And we often said we should find something and do it together. And one day we were at home watching this Norwegian show and wondered if anybody had the rights. So we, we jumped on a plane to Oslo, met the guys. They were really friendly. They said, yeah, you guys can have the rights. And so we adapted their show with their permission. And uh, we made a very successful uh, uh, season one, which I think has just come out on Spectrum October the 26th. Oh, yes, Eight sir. episodes. Crazy show for crazy times. You know, it's a slow burn. You have to stick with it. It's very British. It doesn't spoon feed you with an easy plot line. You've got to hang in there. But great characters, crazy narrative. And execing on it was a real learning curve. Uh, I got to be the other side of the camera. I got to watch people's auditions. I got to choose locations. I got to help with dialogue. All of the things that normally you don't get a chance to do. And then when it was a success and we were given the second season, which we're shooting right now, in fact, I've come from set today, um, we realized we had the opportunity to create something, kind of take it even further. And getting into a writer's room and developing something has been a real, uh, a really fascinating experience. And, you know, I'm very lucky at the moment to have sort of segued through the theatre, through TV, from film now into executive producing a show that I'm in. And, uh, you know, touch wood, I'm very lucky. Well, bravo to you for all of it, for an incredible career, for being able to be a part of this business in all shapes and sizes and now behind the camera as well. Mark Strong, this has been an absolute pleasure and a joy, and I'm grateful for this amazing conversation. Thank you so much for joining us for this SAG After Foundation career conversation, and all the best to you. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for letting me talk about the thing I love for an hour and a half. It's been My absolutely <laughs> It's been wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.